Good morning, everybody. Real early morning out in the West Coast, a little bit early in the East Coast. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for tuning in and joining. I'm very excited today for Sponsorship Morning Coffee. Um, I have good industry friend here, Amir, over at Zoom. You know, Amir, every time we get on the phone, it's like an hour long of us just chatting sports sponsorship, sports data, all of that. Uh, next thing you know, we're, we have to jump off to a new call just because we've gone over time. So excited to have you here and excited to kind of chat with you about just data and how it pertains to sponsorship and how it can be valuable. Yeah, man, I, I got to say you're one of my favorite people to nerd out with and uh, <laughs> you might have to tase us to stop this live web, uh, you know, morning coffee session. But no, super excited to be here. Uh, you know, and one thing we did not plan, you know, I'm ro I'm rocking the WNBA orange tea. You're walking the, the Seattle storm. Uh, Sue Bird, Brianna Parker. I mean, it, just a Brianna story. I mean, like there, there's uh, that. that's too funny. It's, you know, it, was, it felt like a storm day. Um, they're killing it. If, it no, if you all are not watching the WNBA bubble right now, it's insane. Um, it's exciting basketball, so definitely tune in. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, glad that, I'm glad that coordinated. You know, I always try to give some, especially our WNBA clients, some love and, and get that out there. So um, loving it. And love, I haven't gotten my orange hoodie yet. Uh, I need to. Uh, it's, it should be coming in the mail soon, but, uh, but yeah, man, excited to kind of chat data, you know, we'll, we'll start off in, you know, mainly a sponsorship focus here. And I love what you all do at zoom, zoom just with, you know, brand, you know, tying kind of followership to brand affinity and things like that. But, you know, for you, as you think about data within sponsorship, I mean, what does that kind of mean to you? Right? Like, obviously everybody likes to say, Hey, there's data and sponsorship, it's important. Everybody should pay attention to it. But kind of what, what does data like mean to you? And what do you kind of see as some of those more important data pieces? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that, I mean, that's a great question, Nick. And, and I look at data as, uh, you know, elements of a story, right? Um, great brands, great businesses, they have to be great storytellers, too. And uh, it's important that these stories are, um, you know, authentic, uh, they're emotional. They're they're compelling, right? And at the end of the day, these are nonfiction stories in sports. So, uh, you know, you're building a lifelong relationship with your partners. Uh, you're building a lifelong relationship with your fans, and all of that relationship is built on trust. And data builds trust, right? So, if you're not, you know, for me, it's it's understanding, you know, how do we tell that narrative? How do we find that value of what the partners are trying to achieve through? Uh, you know, their partnership with the team uh, and the property. Um, but, you know, it, at the end of the day, there's also this, uh, you know, trend that we're seeing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And you and I have talked about this. We were on the front office sports webinar uh, with, with Joe there. And it's this evolution of uh, attribution and measurement right now that's happening with partnerships. It's not new, right? You know, mm -hmm. we, we, we talked about this. All, all this is done with the pandemic is catalyze these trends that were happening. They're just happening faster. So, you know, brands, uh, they, they own, you know, sort of the relationship. All, all of us serve some client base, right? Whether it's a product or service. And if you're not serving your client, you know, somebody else will give them what they need. And these clients, I mean, these partners, they, they need to understand is my relationship valuable? What is working here? You know, how do I continue it more than ever? So data just builds that trust. Uh, now more than ever, it's so important. And I hate using that phrase, but I mean, it really is. It is truly, you, you have to provide some consistency and they have to understand that value that you provide them. And that's all built on data. Yeah, you, funny thing, I, I and I, this is why I kind of pulled up here, uh, is like literally the thing I had written down here is data tells a story for why sponsors should keep paying you. Right. And that's, I think the key thing you put, you said there that is really, really vital is nonfiction. Right. I mean, data can be manipulated a little bit. What's intriguing to me is, you know, it should not be inspired by a true story. Right. I mean, it should, the data that you use should 100% be, hey, we took you from point A to point B. Here are the data points that kind of prove that. I love that nonfiction piece just because it's 100% true. Data doesn't lie. You can yeah. you can tell different stories with data, but data doesn't lie uh, kind of on that. And, you know, for you, 
what do you see as kind of from just from working with clients what do you see as like the most important data points that you're starting to kind of see today or maybe even pre-pandemic for either what brands are wanting to see or what teams are kind of wanting to tell that story with yeah no um so nick that's uh that's a great point um i think it's going to change with each client right each one is coming to work with you as a property for different reasons uh, that relationship between the property and fan is, is uh, so important. And there's that, that um, you know, you can earn that trust with that fandom, uh, with those with that segment of fans if you need to on the outside. Uh, but there's nothing like in the speed of that relationship between, you know, the, the team wrapping the, their arms around a brand and saying, hey, we're with them and this is why. And so there's different data points that are going to support that, uh, depending on what it is. I think first party data is huge, right? Uh, you know, I, I know like collecting that information and the reason why it's huge is personalizing the experience uh, to fans uh, on the team side and also understanding for the brand side, you know, why, why do people, there, you know, look, no fan base is homogeneous. There's different reasons why people show up to these games or watch these games or interact. Uh, whatever way they're interacting with the brand, whether it's, you know, through the app, through an activation, you know, physically back, you know, in the stands when we get there, um, you know, that personalization is going to be the most critical thing for, you know, creating that relationship and bond. But some of the, uh, cape, you know, sort of metrics that, you know, we look at is what is that value of that partnership, right? What is the value of the exposure? So looking at impressions, right? That That's key, you know, understanding how many people are seeing the, this partnership, looking at engagement, uh, which is even more important because now you're getting a, a, a further level of they interact with the brand. There, there's an element of recall there. Uh, we all love Dr. Wakefield and Wakefield Research, you know, being able to show that re that branding impact and the recalls there. Um, but en engagement's going to hire that. Uh, and then video views, you know, on social, and I'm going to be a little selfish here because, you know, our, our focus is on social and that media content and showing that exposure value. But, you know, all of those elements, whether it's the CPM, CP, or CPV for impressions, engagement, and video views, those all go into factoring what that value is for that specific partner. Okay. Now, there's a social post value and there's a brand value, right? Uh, if a brand, if it's a complete branded post, they get the full value, right? But there's elements of added value too that's important to kind of factor in with these relationships between brands and uh, you know the teams. And it's looking for instances where that partner is being exposed in different ways, whether it's on signage on the court or signage on a jersey and all of that, the brand gets a different value. So if it's a video that's like three minutes long and there's only 20 seconds of different instances of where that logo is being displayed, there's a different value that what that brand receives as a result of that. And there's all different ways of how we, on our side, we try to calculate that factor of recall and, and utilize that as a price. But I think those are really important in justifying that relationship because they they know why they're coming to you. It's the same, and you've done some you know sponsorship morning coffees around this. It's the same why SeatGeek goes to David Dobrik, right? They're getting access to a fandom that is really difficult to get in front of and they're getting full support uh and through that i mean uh you know I, i'll just go on a little tangent on david dobrik for a second you know it's like that instance where uh you know we were kind of talking about it where david went to the dentist and he was drugged up and uh you know from pink killers when they were doing work on his teeth and he was able to recite the entire pitch line from seat geek mm -hmm. and Ian from SeatGeek, the influencer that runs, uh, the influencer manager that runs the program there, he got flooded with videos of teenagers reciting that same pitch after they went to the dentist. That relationship, you know, could not have been built without David. It's the same thing on the team side, right? Like you can't, you can't build that same relationship that they have. So all of these different data points, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, collecting leads that come through a campaign activation. Uh, whether it's, you know, understanding that media exposure value, whatever lines up to that value of why that partner came to you in the first place, 
why they couldn't achieve that without you is important. And, and I know that's kind of a cop out answer on the high level, but I think, you know, we can drill into different ones and give more examples. But, um, you know, what I love, uh, you know, at least with the squad app, what's awesome. And I'm going to give you a shameless plug because I, I think it's amazing. You know, you're understanding how these people are coming to you. You're engaging with them. You know, they're participating through an experience. They're thinking of you. And then you're giving a way for them to reconnect back to it. And they can share that back with the partner as well. And understanding that personalization is absolutely critical and paramount. Um, you know, for you as the team to understand how to best engage with that fan again, and then that partner understanding why they, why, you know, what are the best ways to interact with this fan as well? Um, kind of threw a lot there, but you know, it, I, I think it's a really great topic point of understanding that not, there's not one solution for a data point, you know, there's going to be uh, multiple data points that are going to weave that storytelling narrative that shows that impact. Like you said, at the end of the day, why are we sponsoring you? Or, you know, why is this partnership, you know, why are we renewing this partnership? All of these elements are going to change as parts of the story, but they all are critical points depending on what that outcome that partner is looking for. And I think you bring up a great point there. It's outcome based, right? You know, <clears throat> we're talking about brands, we're talking about teams. And, and one thing that I see is, you know, a partner will say, hey, we're really looking to generate leads, right? As soon as a partner says, says that, that's their main KPI. So everything you should do should funnel down to leads. Now that obviously means awareness is a piece of it. And I know I rag on awareness a lot. We need awareness. It can't be our sole factor and sole data point. Um, but you know, everything you should build the data point story should be back down to, hey, when that renewal time is coming, here's everything we did to funnel and here's how many leads we collected. Right. And as Rich on the inches would say, that shouldn't come at the renewal. It should come at the midway point report and maybe a weekly report and things like that to be able to share. I'm intrigued, though, uh, for your answer on this question, though, because it's, it's one that I struggle with a little bit in sponsorship and in data. The new market, if you think about sponsorship as advertising, the new marketing world speaks in cost per click, cost per lead, cost per CPM, right? In sponsorship, we don't really speak those terms per se, right? I mean, we don't really say, hey, look, here's how much we're going to charge you because it's based on cost per lead. How important do you think it is for us as an industry to totally change how we speak about these things, maybe just to match what our, how our customers think and speak about it? Yeah, you know, you, you, you nailed it right there, Nick. I mean, it's, uh, it's paramount. Brands... Uh, are they're running it right and, and like they will not and they need you to it's you know there's an entire world that is working and speaking in that way and I think sports uh, you know the, the you know there's other factors of the partnership where it was like hospitality and stuff like that right now that's all out the window right uh -huh. so it's even more critical that they're looking at this and trying to understand what that value is you have to help your partner on that brand side uh, explain and justify to their team why this partnership is happening. Now, if you're making them do all the work to try to translate this, um, you know, you're doing yourself a dis an injustice because, um, you know, they might not translate the way that you need them to. They might not, uh, you know, you're making them work harder for them. And maybe that's not what they exactly need at the moment. Um, so whatever you can do to make it as easy as possible to translate to their executive leadership and their organization, why this partnership matters. And for you to do that, you need to speak that same language. Uh, and the other component is they're, re they're investing in tons of other opportunities and sources. They have to be wherever their customer is. So if you're creating this divergent of not being able to go up against where they're investing other dollars, it makes it easier for them to not want to consider you versus what they're seeing with everything else. I know that's kind of a high level answer, but uh, I, I think it's utmost paramount for them to do that. Uh, for, for at least on the team side, try to start adapting more towards that. A and look, it's gonna be uncomfortable for a lot of people because I'm sure a lot of people say, hey, we've never been asked for this before. You don't want to be at a point where when someone does ask for it, you know, you're caught with your pants down, like you're in, like a deer in the headlights, right? And so it's like being more aware of this and, and, and taking that effort 
uh, even if it's not immediately needed, it will be at some point, right? We're going in that direction. We both see it, you and I. We hear it because we're on both sides, you know, hearing it from the brands, hearing from the rights holders, uh, you know, hearing it from the agencies. And so, you know, we're more moving more towards digital. The one way to engage with fans right now is digital, right? There's, unless you're going to, uh, you know, those drive-in, you know, sort of experiences and shout out to the Maple Leafs organized sports and entertainment that, you know, had that awesome, you know, kind of drive-in tons of other properties have done it. But, uh, you know, this is, this is the way of the future. If, you know, if the Mandalorian, this is the way, this is the way. Yeah. You know, as you bring that up, uh, uh, going after other, you know, going paying dollars for other forms of advertisement. And that's my biggest worry in the sports industry is we don't in sports sponsorship, we don't adapt fast enough. And we basically become the fax machine, right? Where I don't know if you know this, but like millions of dollars every year are generated by selling fax machines to this day. Wow. It doesn't mean that it's a it doesn't mean that it's, you know, it's not a billion dollar business, but my worry is, is that in sponsorship, we keep saying, well, you know, we keep selling these signage rights, so we must be doing something right. We don't need to build this and that up. But here's my scenario that really scares me. If I was a brand and I came to you as a team, minor, major, whatever, and I said, hey, you know, what are your engagement rates on Facebook? And how do you lead that back to, you know, sales to prove that, you know, if we do a Facebook you know, highlight post with you all, it's going to lead to sales. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of the answers will be, well, so many fans will see your logo and, you know, they'll be able to see that. And the next time they're online shopping, you're building consideration. Honestly, what I would do is I would say, okay, great. Give me a pricing package. And I would look at their package and I would look how much it would cost to target that fan base with my own Facebook ads, use the same team colors, leave out the logo and just 100% do a cost per click activation. And when the fan clicks on that Facebook ad, like literally if I was a tailgating company or you know a catch-up company, I would target you at pregame. I would literally draw a circle around the stadium to target you with ads. And then honestly, more flexibly and probably cheaper, I can go get direct sales that come directly to me without sponsoring you. That's, that's the nightmare scenario. Like literally if I was still working in a sponsorship department, that would be my nightmare because there is nothing I can do out as a team other than say, yeah, but you don't have our logo. You know, honestly, if somebody told me that as a brand manager, I would, I would say, well, I don't need your logo. I just need your colors in a basketball, right. Or a football. Would love to hear your feedback on that scenario. And, and if that's a very real scenario in your mind, because again, it's, it's one that literally if I was a sponsorship manager and selling, it would keep me up all night. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, you know, I, if I would do the same thing, I mean, honestly, if I was in the brand position and you can't blame them for wanting to do that because they have to do whatever they can do with their margins and try to reach it. But the impact of that relationship, right? There's, you know, that's that exposure media value is something that we just absolutely focus on because there is a factor there, right? There is a difference having that logo, there is a difference weaving that product or service into a narrative in a content series, right? And that difference is, uh, you know, that you can't, you can't fake that, right? You can't achieve that. Um, and without understanding what that affinity is between the fans and that team. And, you know, if, if you, if you're on the sponsorship side, you got to embrace it. You got to know it. You got to go into the conversation knowing that they're probably going to do that. If, uh, if you know, some of the smaller brands are, are absolutely doing it, but people are doing that, whether there's nothing we can do, that is just uh-huh. the system. They're going to try to do whatever they can do. So you need to leverage that relationship that you have with your fans and, show that value very upfront and quickly how there is not, you can't fake that and that difference, right? And that's not an easy thing. If it was an easy thing, then everyone would be printing money at the team side. But, and, and, you know, I tweeted this the other day. It's just like the most valuable asset that sports teams have right now is their digital teams. And it, it boggles my mind seeing how many people are in free agency right now. I get it. It's, it's tough. You know, people are in advance, merch sales are low. You know, I, I, if I wasn't, you know, but anyway, I won't go into that. But like, you know, it's, it, but that is the way to how to best engage, right? And so you're going to need 
uh, fun activations to really engage this audience, right? That's one, 100%. Two is you need to create compelling content. You know, we were talking about storytelling. It's got to emotionally connect with fans. You got to understand who that fan base is. Is it an older fan base? Is it a younger fan base? Depends on what platform you ex execute on. Depends on what elements you put into that story. But that that interaction that you create with your digital team with that brand as a partner and how it's authentically integrated into the storyline, uh, it makes a huge difference. I mean, what uh, Budweiser did when the pandemic first hit, right? And then just focusing on being there, you know, that really connected with a lot of people. And a lot of teams did a lot of great job uh, with jobs with like what they had at the time uh, and what was out there at the time. But, you know, th th that connection that team, fans had with their teams and with the lapse of live sports when it was all paused you really saw how important it was and how terrible it felt to not be able to go to see live sports and how you had to watch replays and then you and i and i'm sure everyone watching this was watching the last dance on espn and that captivated an entire you know global presence of basketball fans from you know giving us nostalgia from those that grew up watching it and you know, showing all the, you know, people that say LeBron James is the GOAT. He's amazing, but MJ is the GOAT, right? Mm -hmm. But like, and I'm kind of deviating from the original question here of like, you know, can people just go after and 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 fake that, you know, uh, re that, that relationship? They're going to try, but you can't fake that connection that fans have with their teams. That is for life, right? And you're seeing that with athletes as well. The athlete influence is growing higher than ever. Let's not discount that e either. But that relationship, there is a value to it, and you cannot fake it. So, you know, showing e – even if you were able to – I mean, I don't know if you could do that. But, like, being able to find, like, this sort of engagement post where people have – like, here's one thing that we've done, Nick, is uh, we've, we've taken content that was around – uh, uh, I'm trying to do this without uh, violating in the NDAs, but like taking content that matched with like, say it's a brand that matched that mentioned a league. Mm -hmm. What was that engagement kind of worth? And then looking at after when there was an official partnership and looking at that engagement, showing that direct correlation of that shift in engagement and fan base and value of that content. I mean, that is a no when they see that, I mean, that's why you're seeing all these brands consistently renew, consistently re-up. Uh, that's why Fox and media are, are selling out of ad revenue. That relationship is just, you can't fake it. Yeah, and I think, I think that's the key piece here is, yes, brands can circumvent you, but they can't build that. They can't build upon that fan engagement. I think the biggest opportunity, and again, kind of going back to the data piece, is if you can build what Facebook ads have into your packages. So you can do a, a one for one of, look, we are going to get awareness. You're going to get retargeting. You're going to get lead generation. You're going to everything you get in Facebook ad, but you're also going to get our passion and our connection with our team. That's when the sponsorship business goes from, you know, a $24 billion one in the U S before pandemic into a 50, hundred billion dollar one, because we've just utilized those tools. I think, I think a lot of times we sell off of that emotion and that's great. It's an amazing thing. But, you know, as that as the qualitative side, we need to match it with the quantitative side to just say, you know, it's so much easier when you're selling a product to be able to say, not only is it amazing and you feel this brand connection with it, but I'm also going to prove how it's going to make you a ton of money. Right. Um, so I think that's that's the biggest thing is if we add these different tools into our toolkit, that's how you overcome somebody not just running ads to your fans. And, and uh, you know, you brought up a really great point. Uh, and another critical business unit, you know, is, of course, the research and business intelligence team and them understanding that relationship with what brought fans to, to the seat. Right. Uh -huh. And knowing that, you know, it's uh, I, I once heard John Becker speak at the San Jose Sharks. And, uh, you know, he was a former CMO at, at or was he president? At, um, I can't recall at the moment at SAP. Uh, and how he treats his fan base as a tech product, like a SaaS platform, and it blew my mind because one, I'm you know I'm a tech product SaaS platform, and kind of hear him say that say that like I was just like, yes, yes, we need more leaders like this in, in sports teams and organizations. And you know, one thing if you talk to anybody in the SaaS tech space is 
uh, growing based off retention is a lot easier than winning, you know, growing from new business. So you have to constantly be showing that value and increasing it. Um, but secondly, uh, you know, it's just understanding like having that knowledge of why these different um, customers and fans are, you know, connecting with the brand. Are they families? What, it, you know, the, all these different segments, you know, going back to what we were saying, it's not homogeneous. There's all different reasons why they show up uh, or why they engage or why they interact. That knowledge, you know, th to the brand that's trying to, you know, um, leak out deals from like targeting and hitting your audience, they won't have that built data warehouse like these team professional teams and organizations uh -huh. do. And that's why, you know, collecting this data, even if you don't know what to do with it yet, but just collecting it. So once you do get to that point is, is paramount so that you can leverage that data to, to understand that connection. But the team teams are now, and and uh, I'm going to do another name drop. Jen Hinkle at the Tennessee Titans. Um, you know, we were having a conversation, and she was like, "I look at my team, you know, my digital team. She's VP of digital there, um, and and so she's like, I look at my organization as a service to the rest of the organization, and we're an in-house agency." And that's why, you know, they're hiring, you know, video people, they're hiring creative director. They understand that they're an in-house agency. They're creating compelling content. Their specialty is engaging their fan base, right? These brands that will try to go after your fans, they're not specialists, right? They're just uh -huh. trying to spray and pray, right? And, uh, but this is, you know, working with the team and especially a team that's got data and understands and a team that understands their digital team is an in-house agency and does specialize in understanding what engages their fan best. That That's the element, Nick, that we're talking about that can't be replicated. And I know that's not something that everyone can do, but it's something that everyone should aspire to do and get to that point of doing. And so, I mean, you're, you're hundred percent right, but embrace it. Just know that that's going to happen. And, you know, uh, it's, people are going to try to copycat and do whatever they can to get in front of your audience base, but you just have to constantly, and it's not going to be a big effort once you, once you do have a system and infrastructure that's yeah. built on that, but it's constantly show that value, uh, through those, th these different engagements. And I know you were saying like at half point halfway point or, you know, the technology today, I mean, you can do this in real time. You see, you know, people hitting websites, you see the traffic, you see the leads, you can pivot and change things as needed. Now, maybe the customer isn't asking for it in real time, which is like great, right? You know, but you still should have that information in real time so that you're always looking at how to maximize that value. Yeah, and I think for that, on that point, I think about TikTok, right? You know, I was telling teams, hey, you know, that we worked with, hey, you should really, as soon as Barcelona and La Liga got on it, I was like, this is a platform we should be looking at. We should be looking at TikTok. We should, you know, the reach is high and all this. At the time, brands weren't asking for TikTok. And that's why, you know, some of them were just like, look, brands aren't asking. And, you know, it's, yeah, we can get views. Um, but when TikTok, it seemed like it was, you know, overnight just was like, Everybody wants to be on TikTok now. It's a new platform. Everybody needs to monetize on it. Um, if you've already built that following there, when that brand does ask, hey, do you do any TikTok? Yeah, we have like a million subscribers. Immediately, it's like, cool, let's do this deal. This team is in front of it. So I think, I think to that point is, you know, get started early on some of these things. You know, with TikTok being said, and obviously more of an awareness piece, I'm interested on your feedback here for this. For you, um, and I was ch chatting with this about about this with another team the other day. In stadium engagement, you know, if there's sixty thousand fans in the stadium, you can say that sixty thousand fans saw that sign or saw that you know saw whatever, right? And there's your awareness piece. Now, when you post it on social media, you're going to get less views, most likely. Um, for that. And, you know, the concern was, is, hey, we're basically taking what we could bank on 60K of viewership in stadium. And now we're saying, hey, the views are much lower. How do we kind of address that? My answer was, obviously, a social view is way more engaged, connected. And, you know, again, you can tag, you can put the sponsor's Twitter tag on there and build in click through pieces. How do you look at that in-stadium awareness compared to like a social awareness? Is there a difference in value there for, for, for brands and for teams? 
Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. And I think there's, I think there's a number of ways of kind of looking at this. Um, you know, one is like you said, Nick, it's, you know, on social, it's quantifiable in a way. Um, if I was a brand, I'd just be like, there's no way all 60,000 were looking at that. Prove it. Show me how, yeah. like I I'd ask that. I don't know if you, they are being asked that, but like, any deal that I make, I'm, I, you better believe I want to understand that, that rep, you know, what I spend, I'm at least seeing three times in return. Yep. And if I'm not, then I'm like, this is not a relationship. If I can't quantify the success of it. So like one, like, and I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone, but I would just be like, Hey, that's bullshit. Like, yep. I'm sorry. Right. And so that social, that is like, that is just, you can't fake that. I mean, it's there, right? You got the impression. Secondly, the engagement, which is huge, you know, being able to show that it is not just passive, it is an active, you know, sort of engagement there. And that's huge, you know, like it's, um, you know, anyone interacting and, and I've seen a lot of your, you know, sort of digital activations that you, you do like that, you know, you're showing direct, uh, it, you know, direct proof, like, you know, people are interacting with this. They find it compelling. They find it interesting. And that's huge, right? You can't fake that. And so uh, and what I would say in just one other level is, so we have passive, we have active. Um, you know, one thing on social that's super important is how do you know how many people are sitting there are in the target audience of what your brand or partner is looking to hit? Now you might have that data, you might not. On social, it's a lot easier. So like one thing that we look at is we don't think all impressions and engagements are created equal. If you can show that this is your target audience that you are achieving, and with social, you can target it better, you know, if you need to on the on the paid side, um, or you can just create the content to really resonate with that audience and understand like when they're online and when to best engage with them and all, all the different variables you can look at. But it is uh, so important. And so uh, one thing that I always recommend is, uh, and this is going to be a very terrible Venn diagram, but take your, take your partner's audience, take your audience and fandom and kind of do an overlap. And this is a terrible Venn diagram. But what does that middle look like? What are, what are those analytics look like? What other things do they follow? What other things do they talk about? What, uh, you know, the fandom is one element, right? It's the oxygen that we all breathe in this room, you know, bar none, but that is one element of that human. And they're much more complex than that. And you, I mean, we all know this, right? You and I, we have, you know, we, we love certain athletes. We love other teams. We might follow one team, but we would love watching another team. I mean, there's so many different aspects to it. If we can understand what that middle overlap looks like and really create content to engage that. And the, the reason why digital, uh, and I'll, I'll, add, I'll add one more element to this, and I'm not going to mention the team or the property or whatever, but we, we have been a, uh, approached to do like partnership opportunities and we did it in, in very earlier years. And, you know, it was digital signage and we we're like, no, <laughs> like, you know, one, we, we knew it wasn't going to be hitting uh, nationwide, like media on a televised game. It was at a you know location that was far above where the cameras were hit it. So, we, you know, there's no, there's no exposure value there. And it's not in the area where we're seeing that, uh, you know, asset detected on social content. So we run AI through it and we could see if it is being hit that or it. And it's like the direct thing was like, I want it on social because one, I can see the return. I can see the audience. You know, we, we, we did one example test with them and we got a call from a podiatrist, which is like, it made no sense, right? For us. And I was just like, oh. what the, this, this is not what I want. Cool. <laughs> like, you know, like uh, someone saw it, but it was like so out of left field that, so not to discredit like in venue and there's a lot of value to that and, and creating a game day experience where it's compelling content and it matches. That's huge. That's important. But um, when it comes to social, I think there's a different element of social proof and, and, uh, that to me, and especially if it was, on, it was on the brand side, I love seeing that too. And you and I, we both work with a lot of the publishers out there to get our content for other people to see it. There's something very different from, you know, someone seeing one of your content to someone constantly engaging with your content yeah. as a brand. I'd want to see that. And I'd want to quantify that. And right now you have no other option, but that. 
Um, so I mean, I think that's a really great question. And then again, at the end of the day, it's all going to depend on what exactly they're looking for. Maybe it, you know, it's a company that was looking to take their team out and reward them. And it was an HR play. Maybe mm -hmm. it was a sales team looking to close deals at this venue, you know, so the, but there's all different elements of that. I mean, in, I'm intrigued on, I think the main thing, and I've always tried to bottle this down for like, hey, why are brands spending on digital, right? Can we just get like a one clear cut for the reason why? And what keeps coming back to me, and I think you brought this up as well, is efficiency toward the goal, right? Whether that's efficiency with action, meaning how much the creative they have to create, how much work they have to do to get a lead, and then also how much does that cost? And, you know, people always, well, people always say, well, why, you know, it's the same thing with like, writing letters versus email well, why do people email instead of still write letters anymore well it's just more efficient i can send an email no problem if i'm writing a letter i gotta hand write it put it in the envelope put a stamp on take it right same thing with advertising i mean you can the crazy thing about advertising on facebook is you can make money while you sleep like literally you could wake up to orders because it's doing its job 24 7 you know, one team that we work with did this for ticketing. And this was the crazy part. They took a sponsor. They basically took uh, a sponsored um, activation. They then launched it um, and, and engaged with fans. And then with that, basically, they the residual was fans would see the activation, go to the website, sign up for the sweepstakes, and then they would go over to tickets. They were selling like, uh, I think it was like 200% of what the sponsorship has spent in getting just a residual of ticket sales. They then took that money and put it back into Facebook ads, which were returning like a 30x on their money. So literally they created this crazy system to where honestly the sponsor funded the first part of it because it was just residual effect of somebody saying, oh, the sweepstakes. Oh yeah, I also want to see if I want to go to this game. Um, took that, re-put it into Facebook ads, and next thing you know, they're, for every dollar they spend, they're getting 30 back in ticket sales. That's, that's why it's so efficient. So I tell that story. I mean, it's a ticket sales story, but I tell that story because that's how brands are thinking about it today. And honestly, a sign doesn't do that. A sign doesn't make you sales after the fact, right? It doesn't reach somebody as soon as they leave the stadium. It takes years for somebody to remember that a certain sign is in a stadium uh, and it's just a less efficient way to spend your dollars. And I think that's the biggest reason why um, we need to shift a little bit. And obviously the pandemic's kind of increasing that as well. Yeah. One thing uh, that, you know, I think our audience in, in, you know, I'd argue you and I are, 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 you know, fall into these categories at this point, we're kind of trained to ignore ads you know, and this kind of goes back to, you know, the, the brand, like trying to hit it, but uh, like hit that audience where we don't see them anymore. It's just not as effective as it used to be just because you do anything too much. And if it gets too overplayed, then it's just not new. It's not enticing. I always look at like, uh, you know, my kids almost too. And it's like, if you know, if he's FaceTiming with grandma, if she's just talking, like sometimes his attention goes away, but if she brings something up on the screen that's new and different, you know, like he's captivated by it. And I think, uh, you know, that content telling a narrative or a fun engagement where it's like a, 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 you know, hey, I'm submitting to be a part of this process, like that kind of deviation from the norm uh, where the partnership is integrated and it makes sense why the partner is integrated into this because you're connecting on a deeper level, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing like I saw the, you know, the the Bud Light home runs, right? You know, if they hit the target, you know, that's, you know, that's classic, you know, Anheuser Bush, uh, you know, like you're, you're seeing, you're like, oh, okay, that's hilarious. You know, if they hit that target or, you know, Heineken with, uh, you know, bring the stadium to you where they have the seat, you know, they're connecting on, on like, you know, levels of like, oh, I go to the game and I have a beer and it's going to be Heineken. Like those things kind of resonate with you in different ways. Uh, and those are sweepstakes. Those are activations, right? That really just connect on a deeper level that, um, that, you know, targeting on ads is, is completely different. Now on the ticket sales sort of process that you were saying, you're, you capture them in that moment, you capture them in that motion, emotion of like, 
I'm showing my fandom. I, you know, it's like people have a relationship that is stronger with their teams than they do with religions. And uh-huh. it's like when you have them in your church, you know, they're they're gonna pray and 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 they're gonna go, you know. So it's like, and I don't have a lot of church metaphors here, but but like basically you have them there, right? And uh-huh. so capture that attention. So understanding how your fan moves digitally is absolutely paramount. There's verbal. Uh, behavior that you're you're gonna see them submit, right? You got a clear in those understanding that you see that okay, they're in they're engaged. So while they're engaged, while I have their thumb stopped from scrolling yep. to other things, you know, keep them going through that funnel in a way that I can keep getting as much as I can out of them in that moment. Uh until you know you lose that. And if it's not compelling, they go back to the billion other things that are trying to get everyone's attention. Um, and, and then the one other thing is there's nonverbal behavior that people are sharing with you as well that, and what I mean by nonverbal digital behavior is, you know, look at your audience. Do they follow you? Do they not follow you? Do they follow that brand? Are they not following that brand? Can you show that that affinity is growing or that follower overlap is growing over time? That's huge. You know, like all these are different elements that uh, go back into that narrative of why this relationship is happening. But I love that sort of mousetrap example. And I'm like, who was that on who, which team? Cause I wanted to bring them on board. But and, and the last thing I'll kind of say is, uh, you know, you know, I always believe in interdisciplinary um, skills and assets or looking at other verticals. You know, we talked about influencers earlier and, and sort of that. But the D to C category, I mean, it is phenomenal to kind of watch what they've been doing, uh, especially during the pandemic where e-commerce is is ever increasing because they're, they understand they're capturing people based off, you know, we're like, hey, are they recording us, right? But, you know, you have behavior that's out there that people are leveraging to understand when is that right moment to surface this or value this. I don't understand why more teams are not uh, putting their merch you know, tap to buy on Instagram when games are happening in the bubble, right? You know, like that is the prime moment or like, you know, the WMNA hoodie, like they did a huge influencer impact. But if, you know, they're able to see that you follow the storm, like that ad should be hitting you. And yeah. and that's where you were kind of saying that we're like, you know, sports, like, you know, honestly, and I, I don't want to offend anyone. It's not usually the teams are not the fastest to innovate on these things. And a lot of times it's innovative, uh, innovation that's forced and maybe it's because you know your your executive team might not value it as much and you haven't had that ability to kind of work with the old card yet to understand that and a lot of organizations that understand it you see them thrive but um you know it's i love looking at other categories and d to c is definitely a great example i think you know i always bring this back i have an mba um in my mba marketing class we spent one week on social media and the goal was just get as many Facebook followers on the group and whoever gets the most gets an automatic A on the project, right? Other than that, we were taught how to buy magazine ads and how to, you know, buy t- television ads and all that, you know, and I said this on a happy hour and I, I don't think it went over too well, but somebody asked me like, well, you're telling all these stories of teams just utterly obliterating with these actions why aren't more teams doing it my answer was kind of you know from what we've seen it's just the mechanics it's understanding how facebook works and it's understanding how other you know i'm always intrigued i'm I'm massively intrigued with influencers because they they literally are masters of monetizing social following like if you are an influencer and you're making money you're getting crazy creative about how you have brands pay you um so I think the biggest thing, you know, for the industry is just it is is just learning. Like run your first Facebook ad. Once you run your first Facebook ad, the value you're going to get back from uh, from it it could totally tank and nobody could purchase, but you're going to understand a few things, right? So I think that's that's the biggest thing is just taking a little bit of time to learn it, but honestly in sports business, we're not taught that, right? We come in and we're told, hey, here's your signage package, here's the benefits, here's the emotion you sell and go sell it. And a lot of times too, you know, I think outside the industry, not a lot of people realize that off season is not off season. Off season is recaps, budget, prep, right? And sometimes that's only two months. So you really have no time to sit back and breathe and be like, you know, we really should build up 
you know, all of our social channels and learn how to do this. Um, so I think that plays a, a, a toll on it as well. But a lot of times from what we're seeing, it's just, just not the chops to be able to run a Facebook ad and retarget, you know, retarget your ticketing page. Everybody who visits your ticketing page within 30 days should get a retargeted ad four days later that says buy these tickets right now. Um, because why not, right? They they were in the market for it. Why not retarget them with kind of that piece? You know, it, it's uh, Nick. You're, you're really nailing it there, and uh, that that MBA story is like too spot on. Um, it's you know, it's it, a lot of the uh, you know, I was in grad school. I was learning more on the job than I was in school. Not to go into like that. Kind of, or actually, let, let's stay away from that tangent. But like, I, I think you hit it there. You know, build plans to monetize what you're doing with your success on social. And I think you need to handle every one of these platforms differently. Uh, there's a different demographic that engages with it. Same people, but when they're on a different platform, you know, they, they have a different mind state. Like, uh, you know, TikTok Zenozi is totally different than, uh, you know, LinkedIn Zenozi, right? And that's the same for all of us. And we, it's, and, and so like have that sort of mind frame of how to generate that value. Maybe your LinkedIn strategy as a property is to connect your B2B sort of partners into those kind of narratives. But there's more inventory that exists and people are getting really creative right now with their inventory. But the great thing about digital, right, is uh, there's no limit to the amount of inventory that you have. I think you need to do your research and think about what are the creative ways based off my fan base and what their interests are and the different segments within it. How do we sort of look at that, uh, you know, and, and really personalize what our activations are between our partner and, and the fan base. Uh, and then the last thing, you know, the, the thing that you're mentioning with ticketing, you're, you're absolutely important, you know, right now, more than ever, I think we just need to think of sports teams as media companies. And so when you're in these elements of, or in, in these conversations of strategy, right. And you said an off season, you nailed it. It's, it's, you know, showing what you, the outcomes of what you did last year. And then it's right back into how are we going to prepare next year? Well, looking at next year, you know, you, you got to think of like, what would Disney do? What would Netflix do? What would, you know, you, that's the mind state that you need to have. And it's uh, understanding what are different ways that we can digitally engage and activate our fans and, and where they're not going to want to delete the app, right? You know, you can't overdo it, uh, but you can do it in a really right way to get that relationship even stronger and even create different ways to, to, to activate them and engage it. But you can't do that without data. You need to yeah. understand who these people are. You need that first party data. You need to understand your social audience and their segmentation. Need, and then understanding what that value is on social is paramount to all of this. I'm waiting for a team to do this. I've said this before on LinkedIn, talk about understanding platforms. If, if you're a team and you know how to run social media ads, if you ran a five part series, where you taught small businesses how to run Facebook ads, you would clean house because yeah. you are now teaching this small business how to make money. Who do you think they're going to go to when they advertise? But it's just things like that, right? Where it's totally understanding what your customer needs, knowing the right platform and being able to kind of put it on there. Um, can, can I add one more thing yeah, too to this? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like going into this, right, there's going to be partnership verticals that have been impacted that you're not, you might not see hotels and, and airplane, uh, you know, like just rushing travel, you know, vertical rushing to, to do more deals or expand. I know a lot of people right now are retention mode, how to show as much value as possible to their current partners. But when looking at new partners, there's going to be a lot of new categories. And these new categories, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, they're, they're these D2C brands. They're these, they're these digital focused, you know, what we were talking about earlier of like, a, you know, using language uh, that, that speaks to them. They're performance based and that's it. They're all data driven. These are apps, right, that, are, that might not have previously been in this category. Uh, you're seeing the MBA with the Oculus with the first VR partner. You're seeing the the first uh, you know demand delivery uh, you know with DoorDash and MBA. Um, you know, look at other you know what people are doing in esports in these different categories. But all of this, there there's your fan base that are using these different products, and so uh, you know leverage and understand what that audience sort of looks like. But you're going to need to prospect and find these new opportunities as well. 
Uh, I, would in, I would encourage imploring that as a strategy of finding new partners that post pandemic, there's going to be brands that want to retain this level of attention that they've had. And you got to think, right? You, there's other data that you got to look at like Clorox, you know, cool. Yeah. Everybody wants Lysol and Clorox and these great brands. Cause the, you know, the germ, that's an easy kind of thing, but also think about like where they are. Like Clorox just reported that, you know, they're, they're going to be out of wipes until 2021 for the rest of the world. So maybe they don't want to market everyone cause they're going to have a negative. There's other aspects of this. And I think, you know, talking to, you know, someone like you, Nick, or someone like myself, you know, we're always here for, you know, we, you know, this is what we do. We, we want to engage, we want to talk and we want to have these conversations. Why I love talking to you so much is because you're hearing from the, all these different angles at different levels of like how to digitally best activate and engage. And that's an art, right? That's an art. You know, you study these influencers in other categories and you implore that with the teams that you work with. And for me, it's just understanding like what are the right connections on the partnership side to 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 leverage that data for the best partnership uh and all this information's out there and you know uh, we're always sharing on, on our different respective channels and this is why i love you know when you were like sponsorship coffee i was like i've got like five six cups of coffee before <laughs> this but i'll have another one with you i mean i love these conversations are awesome yeah no and that's kind of why we do this is just share that information i'm i'm excited to kind of have you on i know we only have a few minutes but last question for you i'm intrigued on your answer what's the most common misconception that you see with data from teams or from properties or anything like that uh so i'll, I'll give a a quick couple, just like two, like main ones that, uh, one is like, Hey, my, our partner hasn't asked for this or not a lot of our partners have asked for this. Spoiler alert. They will. I mean, it, it is coming to that point. And if not, you know, they're going to go, it, it, there's other people that also aggressively want to be in front of your audience as well, but they need to have that data to back it up. Uh, and then the other is like, you know, we get people that are like, we want to be number one, you know, find us a category that we're number one in, or like, how do we take this data and make us as number one? Well, brands have this tech too, right? Like they, it is, you can't fake it. And, uh, you know, the, the number one thing is like, there's no shortcuts in life. And that's a motto that we all know. You got to be gritty with passion, perseverance to get to wherever you need to do. But you need to benchmark yourself and understand where do you kind of fall. So like a lot of people just want to, you know, they want to go to heaven without dying, if you will. And you just, at some point, you need to start somewhere and get there. And those are two kind of misconceptions that I get a lot. Is one is like, hey, you know, this isn't here yet. Well, it's it's coming and the the teams that are leveraging this and doing this lots of them are i mean uh i honestly i don't even know how you find time right now because i'm sure you're getting hit up left and right right now with teams trying to like employ digital ways to activate with their partners but like it's coming and they need to have data behind doing what they do and then secondly it's you're you might not be number one but there's a value your fan base is unique to you you just need to find what audience you have not every audience you know is going to be different you could have like you know i don't know what are, five billion teams right now in la that it's a very difficult market to be in but each fan base has a unique value to it it's just oh. understanding that those are the two biggest kind of misconceptions it's just you know yeah a hundred percent and a hundred percent agree with you on the you know hey they're not asking for it right um you know, sometimes when I talk to teams, hey, they're not really asking for like leads and, and how they're going to be able to retarget. And then I, I'm not a parent yet, so I, I have no idea. But I now understand why my parents were like, oh, you're going to need this, right? Like, you're, this is yes. coming. Yeah, yeah. Like, Don't touch the stove. It's going to be hot, right? And it's, it's like, I, sometimes I get that because it's like, look, maybe this CMO who has been in the game for 40 years and is about to retire doesn't ask for it. But when that renewal comes and it's a brand new spank and see CMO who hundred percent is on digital, if you don't have that, like, like I've seen, like I've literally seen this scenario play out for some teams. If you don't have that stat, they move. They basically just say, cool, we're, you know, we're not going to renew as much or we're not going to renew at all. So uh, I a hundred percent agree with that. Uh, can, I, can I, you, 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 uh, inspired me on one other comment, you know, kind of what you just said there. Um, and it's a little bit of a deviation, but your season and your record on the field or on the court is completely different than your record 
on social and your value with the engagement that you do. They are irrespective of one another. Look at the Phoenix Suns, 8-0 and in the bubble. The, the content that they were just kicking out. Oh, the chef's kiss, right? Like they have activated and engaged your fans in ways that I, I, I just, you know, check out what they were doing. They were doing really great stuff. MLB teams are doing really great right now too. There's a lot to see what others are doing, but it doesn't matter. You know, you know in sports, it does matter, but like winning solves all problems. But uh, you know, you could not have the record or season that you want. That's not an excuse to not do what we're just talking about. I, I always equate that to hard knocks. Sometimes when they do hard knocks, the team the last season has had an atrocious record, but is consistently one of the most watched shows, you know, within sports. And that's just because honestly, we're not watching because we're watching a winning team that is getting together and getting ready for training camp. We're watching because there's not a single person who didn't play high school football who doesn't want to get the inside scoop of what an NFL training camp is like. So you could sit there and be like, man, if I would have made it, I would have been this player. Or I want to see how they do player meetings, right, within an NFL team. So I think I th- 100% there. That is like, as we talk about media companies, if your content is compelling, you could be 0-6. Like literally back when it was the Vikings went 0-16 uh, years and years ago, I would have like chronicled that. I would have showed every behind the scenes meeting, like what happens when a team goes 0 and 16. That's one of the most compelling pieces of content ever, right? Um, yeah. So I think I think that's just you know you're when you're building these, especially content pieces that are going to pull in these digital views and things like that. Like if your team is struggling, and obviously it's probably a lot harder to get content from a team that's struggling because players don't want to talk to you and coaches don't really want to talk to you because they're you know, trying to keep their jobs and and win some games. But, you know, like that's the kind of pieces where you're 100% right. You don't have to be winning to be successful off the court, whether it's merchandise or off the field with merchandise or sponsorship or anything like that. Obviously, it helps. Nothing's better than saying we just won the national championship. (laughs) Everybody loves us. Of course, you should sponsor us. But, you know, it's one of those things where you, 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 as a business and sponsorship, if you don't, you're going to see up, down, up down in business wise that's not that doesn't fly you, you know it's uh it's it's funny uh and uh you know i hate seeing something without facts behind or stats behind it um and, and you just remind me of it i wanted to just share this but um you know some of the best teams during this pause when we were in the pause were the teams that don't historically do well because they're used to having co- creating content without the ability to lean on their sports, you know, their winning record. Yep. And so there, there is a, you know, there is a value to that. Uh, but you, you're absolutely, you know, that, that, you know, connection behind the scenes is so, uh, you know, important. I think the San Antonio Spurs did a report where they should all this different types of content. There was like fans with puppies and babies and like some other thing. And then, it was a picture with an athlete and always the highest engagement on average was a photo with the athlete. So people crave for that behind the scenes content. Yeah. YouTube, I think is the, you know, the place to be right now is the most underutilized because I know a lot of teams want to create their own content on their own platforms, but you, you I mean, YouTube, it's the, that value always increases because it's a library and people are going to search and find and rewatch past content. It continues to provide content year over year. Hundred. If I was a minor league team right now with my season canceled and I had players in the pros, I would just I would literally create a library of, you know, you know, this player's rookie season with top ten hits while he was with our team, because as soon as that player pops off, people are going to be searching on YouTube for highlights. And if you are the top one, next thing you know, your brand is not only getting the views, but that, and that's, and really You're such a marketer. I love it. And, I love and the that, way you think. Yeah. And that, and that just comes back to, again, it's like why I'm so intrigued with influencers is an understanding of the system, right? If you understand that YouTube is a library with long tail value, meaning you're not going to probably get a million views in one hour, you'll probably get a million views over five days, six months, a year. But when somebody searches for that player, you need to make sure that you're the top one and not 10, 10 down. Or even when somebody searches for your team, I'm, I'm intrigued on the pirating. There are absolutely people who have, you know it, 
this team does a terrible job of YouTube content. I'm just going to create my own channel um, and, so, and pirate it. And it's like massive. It like it's people have made millions of dollars doing this. Before kids, I tried vlogging and it is tough. I mean, they're like credit to those content creators. And some of my best content is one, I, I got a Odell Beckham catching a one-handed touch, a one-handed catch in the end zone in slow-mo when we first started working with the Giants and Neelay Shaw back in the day. And I just uploaded it, not thinking, you know, back. But that is like one of my top performing videos. And then secondly, like, uh, you know, the content that I have with the Washington football team, you know, they're local to us and we've been working with them for years. A great, great team that's there right now. Fantastic team uh, in the front office. They, uh, that is some of my best performing content as well. It, just me being there, right? And it was unintentional. I wasn't as strategic and as as a genius as you are. But like, you know, that is some of the, and, and it's because at the time they weren't pouring resources into it. But it is, that is, you're absolutely right. That long tail value and, and going there in the content. I mean, just look at what LSU did with uh, that content, especially the, not everyone has Dwayne Johnson to narrate their, their content script. But uh -huh. if you can resonate and connect with someone that, that that region or locality really connects with, they'll love it. The fans will love it, right? You know, it's just, there's, there's such a great opportunity there. And what I always tell, as we, as we kind of end this, because I know we're over time, but I always tell, when, when I tell that story, I say, the reason why you need to do it today is because the last thing you need is a 15-year-old kid making more money on YouTube on your content than you are. And it's just like, <laughs> if that doesn't tell you, like, hey, we need to start really looking, <laughs> looking yeah. at this. Because if I was a sponsorship, I mean, like, honestly, I might resign if I was a sponsorship manager. And my boss came in and was like, how is this 15-year-old kid getting 2 million in view, two million views of video and we can't get 10,000? And I'd just be like, we messed up. 15 year old kids better than us. You should hire him. Um, so it's it's crazy. But you know, I know we're over time, but thanks so much, Amir, for jumping on. Really, really, really appreciate it. Um, as you can see, we talk about this stuff yeah. all day. Um, but thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll definitely post this back up. Um, but everybody have a great day. Push keep pushing those limits within sports sponsorship and uh, have a great week. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Bye.